Okay, in this video, I am going to be covering chapter 24, genome evolution. Uh, so, talk about comparative genomics, genome size, evolution within the genomes, gene function and expression and patterns, and then finally apply in comparative genomics. So, first section, comparative genomics. Okay, so just a little introduction of what comparative genomics is. So, remember, genomes means that you have the DNA sequence of an organism entirely sequenced. Okay? It's the raw material for evolution. And so what comparative genomics does is it tries to um, obviously analyze the animal's genome, figure out what each gene does, um, under, you know, compare it to other organisms, hence the word comparative genomics, and then it tries to just basically enhance our understanding of how genomes evolved. And hopefully the end goal is how can we improve our lives knowing, um, you know, once we have our genome sequence, how can we improve that genome, you know, like if someone has a faulty protein or a faulty gene, you know, can we, we repair it? So we can link DNA sequences with evolution um, through how, through um, genes and how they contribute to characters, making connections from a change in a gene as well as some modification, um, comparing genomes of different species, and try to understand how those changes bring about morphological differences. So I believe this diagram is in your book as well, and it has various, very, various organisms, very diverse organisms, like baker's yeast, uh, fruit fly, mosquito, pufferfish, and the, what each panel tells you is the year that the genome of that organism was sequenced, the size of it, and then how many genes. And so you might be looking, trying to see if you can figure out a correlation with size and number of genes. So here's humans. Okay, Homo sapiens, we got about 22,000 genes, and you notice that some organisms have way more genes, some have less, and you see that it has really nothing to do with, you know, complexity or even intelligence. Another slide. Okay. So evolutionary differences do accumulate over long periods of time. So when we do a comparison of, of humans with puff, puffer fish genomes, we have discovered that our last common ancestor was 450 million years ago. So 450 million years ago, that was our last common ancestor before we branched off and uh, you know, we became humans and they became the pufferfish. So some genes have been conserved, others are unique to you know, that species. And we have also noticed that there's been an extensive genome rearrangement that has occurred, genes being moved around or reconfigured. 76% um, of genes in humans have counterparts in a flush, uh, sorry, puffer fish. Um, if we take a look at our DNA, we notice that 50% of it's actually repetitive. And puffer fish, they hardly have any repetitive DNA. We have also compared our genome with mice, and the differences are minuscule. So humans have 400 million more nucleotides. We both have around 20,000 genes. We share 99% genes with mice. Our last common ancestor was 75 million years ago, and about 300 genes are unique to either organism, which is about 1% of the genome. Okay, so the human genome shares similarities with existing as well as some extinct primates. And so we have compared our genome with chimpanzees, and it has been discovered that our last common ancestor was 4.1 million years ago. Our genomes differ about 1.23% in terms of nucleotide substitutions, but there's been some very uh, key um, differences in insertions and deletions that have led to either loss of function changes or that maybe that's why we uh, have lost our hair or larger cranium, but that's due to mutations that are either caused by insertions or deletions. So if you take a look at this panel here, it says this figure shows how human, chimpanzee, and gorilla genomes differ more than we thought. In this example, we can see the extreme case of a duplication that is expanded in the chimpanzee and gorilla genomes. So here's the gorilla, here's the chimpanzee, while remaining stable in the human genome, where it is re represented by a single copy. The green arrows and the circle mark the position of the ancestral copy. The red arrows show where the new copies created in the chimpanzees and gorilla genomes are located. Okay, genomes do evolve at different rates. Uh, so humans and mice diverged 75 million years ago, but mice DNA has mutated twice as fast as human DNA, 
Drosophila, and this is mosquitoes, anophilus, um, diverged 250 million, million years ago, but have evolved much more rapidly than vertebrates. And so the hypothesis as to why do genomes evolve at different rates might have to do with generation time. So if they have a shorter generation time, then they will probably have a faster rate of mutation. We have compared, you know, genomes in plants to animal genomes, and it shows that plants' genomes change more rapidly. Um, Non-coding DNA changes are more rapid than protein-coding DNA, um, and then I put down in green here that, you know, we have found many non-coding DNA in fish and primates, uh, very few similarities between Arapidopsis and rice, two varieties of, co of corn can differ by as much as 20 percent, so, um, yeah, just kind of crazy stuff there. I will talk about trans, transposal uh, uh, elements later on in this um, lecture, but what transposable elements are are genes that can move and combine into new combinations. Um, so we think that maybe non-coding DNA changes and protein-coding DNA are brought about by that. Okay, so this is just a side-by-side -side comparison of some plants and Arapidopsis saliana, which is wall crest, um, compared to rice. And this is the part of the mustard seed family. This is the grass family. Um, so take a look at the gene numbers there. Uh, the last time they diverge. This is a dicot. This is a monocot. When we get to plants, you'll understand a little bit more about that, but it's just arrangements of their vessels inside the stems. So distant relatives may share many genes, maybe 80% in this case, um, but they have found that there are some gene families that are shared by every single plant, and maybe those gene families is what makes plants plants. So here's a graph showing rice compared to a Arabidopsis genome and um, how they match up with other plants. Okay, comparison of plants with animals and fungi. Um, so about one-third of Arabidopsis and rice genes appear to be plant genes. And the remaining genes, believe it or not, are similar to animal and fungal genomes. And genes that are similar to these animal and fungal genomes deal with metabolism, genome replication and repair, transcription, as well as protein synthesis. So review questions. Humans and pufferfish diverged from a common ancestor about 450 million years ago, and these two genomes have? The answer is C, share about 75% of the genes in the genomes. Two, genome comparisons have suggested that my, mouse DNA has mutated about twice as fast as human DNA. What is a possible explanation for this discrepancy? And that would be D, mice have shorter generation time. Oh, I forgot I have my little D. Okay. Moving on to genome size. Um, so I'm going to talk about autopolyploidy and allopolyploidy, and you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute, I've heard those words before. Yes, you have. Um, and then explain why most crosses do not result in new polyploid species, and um, talk about how they don't always ident are identical to the parental uh, genomes, and that genome size and genome number do not correlate. So polyploidy, remember, means you have three or more chromosome sets, and they can give rise to new species. There are two ways a polyploid organism can occur, and that is either through genome duplication in one species or a hybridization of two different species. So these are vocab terms you have also come across. Autopolyploids arise from the genome duplication within the single lineage, and these are brought about by meiotic error. So during the process of meiosis, the homologous chromosomes don't um, separate correctly. Allopolyploids result from hybridization and subsequent duplication of the genomes of two different species. Uh, so basically, uh, egg of one species, sperm, or pollen of another, and they meet and fuse, and as a result, you end up with duplicated genomes. Genome duplication is way more frequent in plants than it is in animals. So we have encountered um, these polyploid organisms in the supermarket, okay? Because polyploidy can make a plant bigger, or the flowers bigger, or the fruits bigger, or the leaves bigger. And so those strawberries that you see in the supermarket, those are polyploid because they're huge. But if you go hike in outside and you come across a strawberry patch, uh, it's really, really small. This is just a complex analysis of sequence divergence among duplicated gene pairs. And the presence or absence of duplicated gene pairs provides when gene loss or gene duplication occurs. 
Um, so you can see that when we have genome duplication, it is followed by a period of um, lost duplicated genes. So this is going this way. Um, so genome duplication occurs, then you, it follows by a pattern of rapid loss, and then it will occur, and then it's followed by a pattern of rapid loss. So avenues of research that deal with polyploids, paleopolyploids, the study of ancient polyploids, what we try to do is sequence uh, comparisons and use phylogenetic tools to establish time and patterns of these polyploidy events. And then another avenue of research that we uh, use is synthetic polyploids, meaning crest implants, most closely related to the ancestral speci species, and then chemically inducing chromosome doubling and then trying to do it, uh, you know, like we control it. So without doubling, the plant would be uh, sterile, so we have to double it. So commercial bananas are 3N and sterile, they're seedless. And the little black dots that you see inside the banana, those are the aborted ovules. Evidence of ancient polyploid is uh, found in plant genomes across the board, as you can see here in this cladogram. So polyploidy has occurred numerous times in the evolution of flowering plants. Um, so yeah, these are all flowering plants, it looks like. Uh, so a quick comparison, let's just take a look at soybeans and M. trochanta. Soybeans, let's see if we can find it here. M. trochanta and soybeans. So we're going to take a look at the sister group here. Okay, so you can see that uh, increase in a genome size through polyploidization, but it has definitely downsized in the M. trochantula. Oof. Polyploidy also induces elimination of duplicated genes. So after an allo polyploid um, from two different species forms, it's followed by the rapid loss of genes and obviously some rearrangement that occurs. Uh, so an example of an allo polyploidy is tobacco. It occurred about five million years ago by crossing this species, so we'll just say big S, big S, with this species, big T, big T, and we have a hybrid. But then it undergoes duplication, because otherwise it would just be sterile. So it undergoes duplication. And now it is SSTT, and this is the tobacco that we, um, you know, that people can smoke. Okay, so no homologous chromosomes in a sterile offspring, as you can see here. But if you double it, then you do end up with a hybrid that can reproduce. So allele, polyploidy, uh, the chromosome number within a sterile hybrid will double, and then you end up with a fertile hybrid. I believe this is the the diagram in your book that talks about allopolyploidy, and this is the two species of tobacco, and the result right here. Okay, another example of um, allopolyploidy is wheat. So please take a look at this. This is in your book, um, but we have Trichantum cicero. I can't see. It's kind of, and then the mono monocosmote. Okay, we'll just say big A, big A, and a big B, big B. Um, but it's a sterile hybrid, and all of a sudden the chromosomes undergo doubling. So now we end up with this species, AABB, and we have a third species, and it is a sterile hybrid, and it doubles, and now we have the wheat that we use in um, bacon. So it's actually one of the most important food, food plants in the world. Polyploid can also alter gene expression. It could be connected to the increase in methylation of cytosines in DNA or uh, short-term silence in, of some genes. Now remember when I said that um, transposons, sometimes genes can jump from one chromosome to the next? Well, when that happens, uh, you know, like in polyploidy, they, the, they can be mobilized. They, they could, they can jump. So Bar Barbara McClintock, who actually won the Nobel P uh, Prize in science for this, hypothesized that transposons, basically DNA that can jump, were controlling elements. And um, so she, what she did is she, you know, can we respond to the genome shock and jump into a new position? And as a result, new phenotypes could emerge. And um, how her research actually came about was kernels in um, corn and how some kind of had this uh, purplish blue pigmentation and, and some you know were lighter in color and so she just asked the question why are these kernels like spotted what is going on here and it turns out that translocation or transposons um, were, were the cause of it so it's kind of cool okay so polyploidy doesn't account for variation in genome size um, so humans have nine times the DNA uh, versus puffer fish, but roughly the same amount of genes. 
we don't really you know know maybe why that is um, non-coding dna which are introns inflates the genome size we do have a lot of non-coding dna introns that get spliced out when mrna uh, is made and so maybe that's why we have a greater amount of dna uh, because we have more introns than another organism okay View questions. Polyploidy in plants. It is. Oh, sorry. Thought I had my little thing there. D. Um, no, wait. Sorry. Hold on. I have a student. What do you got, Mandy? Okay, why don't you hand it in the box? So polyploidy in plants is D, uh, common. Uh, and it does occur in some animals. And I think your book talks about fish and amphibians. Um, but it's, yeah, those are kind of the, big, the two big ones. In general, as genome size increases, there is a D, a, a decrease in the amount of, oh, sorry, E, C, an increase in the amount of um, DNA. Wow. Struggled with that one. Okay, 24 point three evolution with genomes. So chromosomes can be duplicated and when that happens we end up with a process called annual ploidy, the duplication or loss of an individual individual chromosome rather than the entire genome. So everything in that last section was like the entire genome being copied. Okay, all of the chromosomes being copied. Here this is just one individual chromosome that's either lost or duplicated. And so failure to pair um, of the homologous chromosomes or sister chromatids that separate uh, during meiosis can result in annual ploidy. DNA segments can also um, be duplicated, and this is the greatest source of new traits that we see. And so there are three fates for the duplicated gene, either a loss of function, which is the fate for most, the gaining of a new function, or the total uh, function gets divided up uh, into two different duplicates. And so I put in green kind of like extra tidbit information that you really don't need to know, but a duplicated gene may have different levels of expression based on where it's at and when it's active during development. Humans have the highest rate of duplication in, in, three, um, in three most rich gene chromosomes, and the least amount of duplication is found in uh, seven chromosomes with the fewest genes. So rates of duplication occur on chromosomes that have a lot of genes versus those that don't have a lot of genes. Genes must be duplicated, uh, especially during growth and development, immune system genes, and cell surface receptors. Okay, so the human Y chromosome, which is found in males, um, you know, does consist of some duplications, as you can see by their color code. Each orange region has 98% sequence similarity with a sequence on a different human chromosome. And each dark blue region, denoted here, 98% similarity with a sequence uh, elsewhere on the Y chromosome. Okay, remember when we talked about, no, we did not talk about this. Uh, so I'm going to talk about paralogs and orthologs. So paralogs are two genes within an organism that arose from duplication of a single gene in an ancestor. And orthologs means that it was inherited um, of a single gene from a common ancestor is actually conserved. So you can see that we're looking at a glob globin gene here, and there's two types, alpha and beta. And we have a gene duplication that occurs, and it partitions off. And so this side um, right here, you can consider as an ortholog, and over here also ortholog. But when I do a side-by-side -side comparison of um, um, alpha globin versus beta globin in mice, both in mice, it is considered a paralog. Genomes can be rearranged. We've noticed that in uh, chimps and gorillas and orangutans, they have one more chromosome than we do. So we didn't lose a chromosome. It appears that maybe two ape chromosomes fused together, and this is the result. And as a result, it turned into chromosome two for us. And so we have some genome reorganization that 
uh, can provide some clues, but it's not always, there's not always proof as to really how closely related two species are. So when we compare it with our logs um, shared by humans and chickens and mice, we found that 72 chromosomal arrangements occurred since the chicken and human shared common ancestors. 128 arrangements occurred between chicken and mice, and then 171 between mice and humans. And so just because we have uh, fewer chromosomal arrangements, like a little bit more in common, does not mean that we are closely related to them. Okay, correlation does not mean causation. So actually it shows that the chromosomal rearrangements occurred slower in lineages that led to humans and to chickens than lead into mice, because mice have a faster generation time. Okay. Okay, another concept that kind of goes along with this is conservation of syntony, um, which means that DNA segments are preserved in related species. And so the cool thing about this is we can find a gene in one species, and then it allows us um, to compare it to another gene in another species and gather information about what that gene does, or maybe it does the same thing. So you can actually swap genes out and it, it, it would be just fine. Gene activation results in pseudogenes. Um, so this is a very important way for genomes to involve loss of function, which I have discussed earlier, where a gene loses its function. That's one of the outcomes uh, of, um, okay, what did I say? There's three outcomes. Let me find that note for you. Three outcomes. Of course, I can't find it. Well, there's a slide that says there's one of three outcomes. Ah, here it is, slide 29. So it says fates of duplicated genes, either a lose in function through subsequent mutation, which is the fate for most, gain in a new function, or total function breaks up into two duplicates. Okay, so one example of loss of gene function is the olfactory receptor, or OR genes, in, in, in us. So we have genes that code for receptors, and these receptors bind to odorants molecules that help us perceive smell. And what these odorants do is they start the signal transduction event and send signals to our brain, and then we you know, perceive that smell. So primates have over a thousand copies of olfactory receptor genes. And our um, olfactory receptor genes, 60% of them are inactive, and so we call them pseudogenes. Sequences of DNA that are very similar to the functional ones, but they do not produce a functional product maybe because there's a premature stop codon or a missense mutation or deletions. And as a result, humans, we have to rely on other senses. Yes, you know, some of us can, can smell, um, but if, you know, our olfactory receptor genes, our sense of smell is not as great as primates or to dogs. Okay, just wanna make sure I didn't skip a slide. Rearranged DNA can occur or acquire new functions um, so remember, mistakes can happen in meiosis, and they can often create pseudogenes, but a broken piece of a gene can end up in a new spot and pick up a new function. So one example of that is ice fish and how they survive Antarctic waters due to this antifreeze protein that they have. So it's a nice a nine base pair uh, of a gene coding for a digestive enzyme. It evolved to encode part of an antifreeze protein, and then through a series of errors, it persisted only because of some massive, massive cooling that occurred in the Antarctic water. And natural selection worked on that chance mutation, and as a result, they have a gene, a new gene, um, you know, a gene that took on a new job uh, for the antifreeze protein. Genes can also transfer horizontally, basically hitchhike from one species to another, and this obviously makes our phylogenetic trees a little bit more complicated, as you can see in this diagram. It's different from vertical gene transfer, which means it goes from parents to offspring and then to the next generation. So human genome, uh, we do have a lot of ancient transposons that don't, that basically aren't human, they come from you know different animals or whatnot. Um, but Drosophila eliminates unnecessary DNA from their genome 75% faster than we do, and so as a result, our genome has, you know, still retains a lot of those transposons, and mice continue to add new transposons as well. Um, so gene swapping, we call this gene swapping, horizontal gene transfer, means that loss of, loss of gene swapping um, caused researchers to re-examine the, the base of the tree of life, okay? 
Uh, we looked at early phylogenies based on our RNA, and it indicates that maybe early prokaryotes gave rise to two major domains, bacteria and archaea. And from one of these, eukarya emerged, and studies have found that um, that archaea are closely related to eukarya than they are to bacteria. So, yeah, lots of things discovered based on horizontal gene transfer. Okay, homologous genes in distantly related organisms can often be easily located on chromosomes due to, the answer is B. Six, all of the following are believed to contribute to genomic diversity among various species except B, gene transcription. That's the only one we haven't discussed. I don't even know what gene transcription, I mean, I do, what I know what that is, but we haven't mentioned it at all. What is the fate of most duplicated genes? That would be slide 29, I think, uh, when I was looking for it, uh, gene inactivation. Okay, the fourth section of five, gene function and expression patterns. Um, so genes are expressed at different times, in different tissues, and in different amounts and combinations. You may remember my little analogy of, you know, the conductor stepping up, up to the podium and he takes his baton and um, gives the, the first beat and the tuba starts playing like Indigata and the Vita and um, someone's playing the 1812 Overture and you know everyone's playing this different song. Um, so it's like all of your genes turned on at once would be a really, really bad thing in cells. So, so you know, in cells, genes, they're, they're turned on at different times, they turn off. Uh, some tissues only read certain genes. So we've actually found a CFTR gene, which is responsible for cystic fibrosis in both mice and humans. And when that gene is defected in us, it leads to that disease, cystic fibrosis fibrosis. But in mice, um, when they have that defective gene, it doesn't lead to lung symptoms. And so this is this obviously really interests scientists as to like, why is that? So another uh, example, we've done sequence comparisons that show chimp DNA is 98.7% identical to human DNA. And just gene sequences similarity increases to 99.2%. So how can two species differ so much in body and behavior and yet have almost equivalent sets of genes? So we're going to talk about gene transcription patterns. So both uh, in chimps and humans show patterns of gene transcription activity, at least in the brain cells. And these post-transcriptional differences play a role in creating distinct organisms from basically very, very similar genomes. So one difference, one big difference between chimps and us is speech. It's uniquely human. Okay, it's, a, it's a complex expression. So a single point mutation in a gene called FOXP2 means that impaired speech uh, and grammar occur, but not language comprehension. So the ability to speak and, you know, gram, I, I don't know what they mean by grammar, like uh, just talking, I guess, uh, but not language comprehension. So that means if someone talks to you, you un understand what they're saying. They have found the fox P2 gene in chimps, gorillas, orangutans, rhesus monkeys, and mice. And they've noticed that gene expression in areas of the brain that affect motor function is, is where it's the big differences are. So there's some key protein differences. Mice and humans differ by only three amino acids. In other primates, it's a difference of two amino acids in the protein. Yet none of these organisms chimps, gorillas, orangutans, mice, speak. And I mean, that's a very, very small difference. Only a single amino acid sequence, like letter, sorry, not letter, only a single amino acid difference between mice and chimpanzees. So um, culture is closely tied to the ability uh, to control your larynx and your mouth and your tongue to produce speech. And if a fox P2 uh, mutates in mice, they notice that the mice don't, they don't squeak. And so they think maybe this gene plays a role in neuromuscular pathways to make sounds. Maybe um, this is the reason why we have like the, these differences between us and these animals uh, make it possible for language to arise. You know, Fox P2 mutations allow the brain and the larynx and the mouth basically to coordinate together to produce speech. So I found this slide. Okay, first let me talk about this one. So this is just showing the comparison of changes in Fox P2 genes and how just two amino acids correspond to the emergence of the human language, as you can see right here. And so the beige bars represent uh, synonymous changes and the brown bars represent non-synonymous changes. 
this is uh, <laughs> looking at humans, uh, gender, the expression of the fox P2 genes, okay? Boys versus girls. I'll let you make that conclusion on your own. Okay, so review questions. Chimp and human DNA is close to 99% similar. Morphological differences. Uh, the answer is A, must be due largely to gene expression when those genes get turned on. Okay, the final section, applying comparative genomics. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, genetic basis for disease and pathogens and drug development and endangered species. So distantly related genomes offer clues for causes of disease. Um, so when we compare individual human genome, it continues to give us information about genetic disease detection and the best course of treatment for that disease. We do have some conserved genes between humans and pufferfish, and it does provide some clues to human diseases. We have discovered that a lot of times, if you have an amino acid change, then the disease uh, will be brought about. Closely related organisms enhance medical research. Comparing mice and human genomes revealed the function of a thousand previously unidentified human genes. We also have an extensive data on rat physiology, and that's why we tend to use rats a lot in our studies. Um, but we're linking, um, it says rates, supposed to be use rat genome compared to human genome to link genes and disease. Pathogens, you know, the host genome differences reveal drug targets like malaria. Malaria is caused by a protist, and then that protist lives in the saliva of the mosquito. So basically the mosquito is the vector and it causes a lot of deaths every year. It's difficult to treat because the protist hides from our immune system inside red blood cells. And so as a result, once it's inside a red blood cell, it cloaks itself and our immune system can't find it. Sequencing reveals a link to chloroplast-like structures. So on the um, parasite, there's a structure called the ap apical plast, um, which derived from the chloroplast, and uh, it's involved in synthesizing a molecule during the infection process. So you need the apical blast in order to infect a host cell. Uh, it's also in, is involved in lipid biosynthesis and cell metabolism. But the unique difference, um, but with the presence of an apical blast, wow, there's a unique difference between the host and the parasite. Uh, so one missing piece of information in the apical blast puzzle, however, is why um, they retain um, something called a vestigial plastid, despite losing the ability for photosynthesis, because apical, apical plast is similar to chloroplast. So a probable answer to this question is that maybe the plastid provides a function that is important to the parasite survival. You know, like in algae and plants, plastids, so plastids are like, I should, guess I should talk about what plastids are. They can store things. Plastids can store like star starches and sugars um, and other things. But plastids are not only involved in photosynthesis, but they are also um, responsible for other functions. And we've learned that apical blast, like some plant plastids, participate in lipid biosynthesis and iron metabolism. And so two different lines of evidence show that apical blasts are essential in these parasites. Uh, first, we have chemicals that affect the apical blast metabolism uh, re that resulted in parasite death. Second, the parasites that were unable to replicate the apical plast also died. And amazingly, in both cases, the parasites only die in the next generation. It's kind of weird. Um, this means that maybe the parasites can survive with no apical plast while remaining in the infected host cell. Um, but remember, the parasite is unable to establish a successful new infection. So this phenomena, they have called it, is delayed death. So yeah, cool stuff. Who knew? So this is a diagram showing the apical plast uh, up here and showing it how it's like related to chloroplast. Very complicated diagram, but you might notice, oh, hey guys, look, it's glucose and glycolysis and um, oh, hey, there's mitochondria with the Krebs cycle and I don't know, but just a, I, I got a lot of that information from a research paper. Okay, pathogens. Um, so host genome differences reveal drug targets like the disease Chagas, which is caused by a protozoan, kills about 21,000 people per year in, in Central and South America. The common core of the 6,200 genes is shared among the three pathogens, like T. cruzi, uh, Leishmania major, T. barusi, 
Uh, currently, there's really no effective vaccines and only a few drugs with limited effectiveness, but all of them share some core genes. And so the idea is if we can find one gene that affects one, maybe that same gene will help um, cure these other two. Okay, genome comparisons inform conservation biology. So genomes of species that are on the brink of extinction are being examined to help us find ways to reduce disease. Tasmanian devils, uh, in I think it's either New Zealand or Australia, they are basically being decimated by a tumor disease called devil facial tumor disease. And 90% of it, uh, of the population is affected, 60% of them are wiped out, and they have low genetic diversity. We've discovered that through sequencing. And so humans are putting breeding programs in place to try to conserve this, these animals. Giant pandas, extremely diverse despite their diet of just bamboo and their habitat destruction from us. Uh, so relatives were actually carnivores and they still maintain those genes, but they don't fully digest the bamboo when we look at those genes. That's interesting. Polar bears, the entire maternal line can be traced back to a brown bear living in Ireland 20,000 to 50,000 years ago. So a lot of cool things with genome comparisons and cons conservation um, biology. So this is just showing a slide of um, endangered, so genetic diversity within the species. And then green means not endangered, and then those that are extinct. And you notice that the ones that are extinct, you know, they kind of have low genetic diversity. And those that are endangered, you know what, even, um, you know, low as well. Um, and these guys, I think they get poached uh, a lot. Crop improvement, model plant genomes provide links to genetics of pro crop plants. Um, so what we're doing is we're finding beneficial bacteria genes oh, nuts, uh, that are located that we can find and then we utilize them by inserting them into um, the crops. So we can take this Pseudomonas florescens that naturally protects plant roots from disease and work on chemical pathways and maybe insert genes to help reduce disease. Uh, they can be inserted in like Pt crops and maybe improve overall crop yield. All right, one review question, final slide. An herbicide that targets the chloroplast might be effective against malaria because A, uh, both chloroplast and malaria, they have an apical blast, so the plasmodium needs a functional apical blast in order to infect the host cell. All right, so that does it for um, chapter 24.